Welcome again. Hope you all had coffee and cake and are happy now. Um, I'm going to talk to on the topic of uh, UPnP, universal pwn and play, as we call it. Um, if you're an attacker, it's the most amazing protocol you ever found on the network. If you're a defender, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You'll see why. <laughs> um, agenda, first of all, a bit of an overview of what is UPnP. Then we're going to attack, uh, sorry, cover a bit like how it works and attacks and a bit of defense also, of course, and maybe a demo at the end. We'll see about that, actually. We had a bit of um, technical problems also. UPnP, what is it? How does it work? Um, it's universal plug and play. And if you think back, for some of you at least, um, something like 20 years, about the early days, you bought a printer, you bought a, a scanner or whatever, and then you had to plug it onto your machine and get it connected somehow and get it to talk and it never worked and your parents called you and all that. And so then they came up first of all with plug and play and then for the network universal plug and play. I mean, the idea is quite obvious. What you want to have is that device that you just put on your network and it all works and it's magic and if you you know, your parents can do it. And well, that's what, what it was designed like. So, what you really need to remember about it, what's the important point about it is, there's no authentication, there's no, no passwords, no anything, there's um, no usernames, no stuff. It's just talking to each other and if there's a you know, server client, um, it will provide functionality to whoever connects to it and there's no levels between you know, regular users or, or administrators or whatever because that would assume that you have passwords in between, which you don't. So, if there's a UPnP device, see what it can do for you, and quite often there's a lot. Um, yeah, it's not so much, maybe you well, wonder if you see this on a, like on a company network. It's mostly for residential use, really. But if you're looking around, for example, right now, you have the overhead projectors nowadays. You're, I mean, all your printers, all your TVs, your DSL routers and everything else, they're all talking UPnP. Your phones, your applications, there's a lot of them. And UPnP is probably one of the most widely deployed protocols on the local networks and sort of sadly also on the internet because no one stopped it. Um, yeah, it's a combination of you know SSDP, there's HTTP. It, um, it's partly based on UDP, it's partly based on TCP. And it all works together quite amazingly and provides all sorts of functionality in the end. Um, yeah, so first of all, how does it work? Basically, you have your operating system, let's say uh, Windows, and it wants to find out what kind of UPnP devices there are on the local network. So that's what it does. It sends out a, um, a single UDP packet, port 1900, multicast address, and it's uh, that's the, what do you see down there? The M search. It's are there any UPnP devices on this network? If so, please reply. And that's what you get back. That's your reply, also UDP coming from the devices. Looks something like this. The interesting part is the red part, where it specifies, well, yes, I'm over here. If you want to talk to me, and if you want to find out what I can do for you, what kind of services I offer, and what kind of functionality, um, you connect to my HTTP port on, you know, IP port, whatever, and there's an XML file waiting for you. You know, just download the file, pass it, and it's all in there what I can do for you. Um, yes, so yeah, exactly, that's this part actually. So your Windows, the next step is going to be, it will connect to this advertised HTTP port, will download the XML file, and then find out, so what kind of device am I actually talking to? What is this? What does it offer? And then you see it on your system tray or similar, or Depends on the functionality, of course. Oh, yes. Um, I know it's hard to read. It's small. It's intentional, by the way. Don't even read it. Um, you get a whole lot of information in these XML files. I remove the, you know, the clutter, basically, and it's part of what you get. So what you see in this case, for example, so what kind of device is it? Oh, well, it's a residential. It's an internet gateway device. Oh, it's manufactured by Linksys. Um, it's, you see the model, you even see the software version. Isn't that amazing if you're an attacker? Knowing, you know, very detailed what you're talking to, and then you can just Google for exploits, basically. Um, yeah, UPnP attacks, attacks, there's a whole bunch. DDoS was quite famous for a while. Um, 
if you think back once again, there's a UDP packet, a single packet going out, and then there's a reply coming back. So that's quite ideal for you know your normal amplification attacks because the UDP is easily spoofable. So you send out a small packet requesting information from a UPnP device, and you get back a sort of you know a bigger packet announcing all sorts of services. So you just spoof the source IP to whatever victim you want to hit, and well, and direct a whole lot of traffic this way. And this was quite um, quite in use on the internet for a while until they switched to NTP and and well, whatever stuff it's nowadays. Um, in general, UPnP. You saw the XML, and they offer all sorts of functionality, which means there's interfaces, different interfaces uh, providing different functions. Um, and unlike ZeroConf, as far as I know, UPnP is more like a platform. So it's every vendor can basically just use the UPnP functionality and then implement their own whatever they want to have on top of it. So there you have, it's not standardized. Basically, whatever device you order, they have different functions under different names with different functionality. And it's really it's sort of amazing whatever you find in these devices. For example, so once again, there's no authentication, no whatever. If you can talk to it, you can use all the functionality it offers. So for example, if a bunch of devices offering you to remotely change the DNS settings. Well, if you're talking to the local router on the, on the network and you can change the DNS settings without being, you know, not logging in, being administrator or anything, you just send a plain text a request to the UPnP interface, can you please change the DNS to this server, which is under my control, and you get back a HTTP 200, yeah, sure, why not? Um, it's sort of scary, I guess, as a defender, but it gets better. Um, the requesting the PPP username and password um, that's not, uh, you know, sort of, well, let's call it a feature because it's even in the standard. That's defined in the UPnP docs if you read them. So, same stuff, um, plain text requests. Well, actually, this is one interface, and I'm calling the um, PPP password function. Can you please send it over? And, well, simple SOAP uh, request on the HTTP interface. Um, you see the van PPP connection interface being called in the get password function. Simple stuff, that's the reply, and sure enough, why not? Here's the password. Once again, no authentication, just, you know, talk to it. It's, it's a feature, that's what I mean about functionality. Um, what else do we have? Oh yeah, that was fun too. Um, what about remotely changing the admin password, of course, without having the old one in the first place? Because some vendors think that's a good idea, um, that's what you find out there. Um, yeah, that's another one. That was a quite big vendor, actually. Um, I don't know how many devices implemented this one, but it was remotely possible to, on the one hand, request the Wi-Fi, the SSID, and also the plain text Wi-Fi password, because why not? Um, yeah, UPnP, amazing stuff. And uh, like I said, it's every vendor seems to implement it by, on its own, and provide its own functionality, and we'll get to auditing it later and how we have a look at it and see what kind of functions your device may offer. That was one fun, that one was quite fantastic. Um, so, I mean, UPnP is designed for residential use, for, you know, home networks and similar. There's basically, there's no point in UPnP being provided on your DSL routers on the internet side, on the, you know, on the WAN interface. Um, for whatever reason, it seems to be the default. So you have millions of devices out there on the internet, really, um, happily speaking, UPnP to you over the network, over the internet, that is. Including, I mean, UPnP, a big part of the functionality is when you're running applications or games or so on your local network on the inside. So it can talk to the router, for example, hey, um, I would need a port forward. I need this external port forwarded to me. Can you do this for me, please? That would be so great. Now the fun part is, of course, if this also works over the internet, and it does. So it means you have a, you know, you can talk to it over the internet. Could you please open this external port and forward it to the inside to this IP address? And yeah, sure, why not? Um, so it's, you know, whatever those devices, they 
being so cut off as well, we're implementing our firewall and anti-hacker stuff and whatnot. Um, and then run UPnP on the inter external interface and you can just ask for a connection to the inside. Now, even better, the IP address you specify doesn't have to be on the inside. You can also specify an IP address on the, on the external side, on the internet. So you can use it to uh, just bounce around. So you can talk to UPnP, can you please add port forwarding, um, forward port 25,000 maybe to you know, whitehouse.gov port 80, I'd like to do some stuff. And yes, it will do so. And so that's not rare, by the way. That's a lot of devices doing this. Um, yeah, that's one of the requests. You just you specify external port and internal port where you want to connect to the IP address. And oh yeah, least duration. It's also fun. I think it's the next slide actually. Yeah. I mean those devices typically no logging. Um, it's not just TCP. You can also use it. You know, doing UDP. And also, quite um, handy for an attacker, there's a custom timeout that you can specify, so the rule will be gone after a while. Um, yeah, finding UPnP devices on the internet. Um, some years back, in late 2012, H.E. Moore, the guy behind the Metasploit project, um, he scanned the entire internet for UPnP devices, so at least you know finding the ones that wanted to talk to him. And he found about 80 million devices, something like 2% of the internet, talking UPnP over the internet, talking to him, because you had something like 7,000 vendors back then already implementing UPnP in a sort of creative way. And 1,500 vendors, I suppose, is many more by now. So you can't just easily patch this. It's not like you can talk to those 5, 10, 20, 50, whatever vendors, and get them to patch it when you have so many. Um, yeah. So what he was doing is sending these, what we saw earlier, the UDP packet on port 1900, basically uh, um, what Windows also sends on the local network. It's a, uh, hi, um, are you a UPnP device? If so, please talk back to me and tell me where to find the XML config. And so of note, which is why I'm pointing it out here, so I tested this, it doesn't work for Windows. Um, which also means if that's not Windows source replying, those 80 million devices. There was all sorts of embedded devices, with really. printers, network attack storage, um, routers, of course, and many, many of them, and TVs and digital video recorders and cameras and everything else, um, which was later used, by the way, when was the Mirai botnet, something like two years ago, the IoT botnet, it was used for DDoS, um, that was a whole lot of these devices also, yeah. Um, once again, also, so UDP to port 1900, are you a UPnP device? UDP back, yes, I am. My high port TCP is over there. That's where all the functionality is. That's where you talk to and where you, you know, get your whatever you want to do. That's all TCP. That means just because port 1900 UDP is blocked and you can't talk to it, it doesn't mean you cannot talk to the UPnP device. If the TCP high port is open still, and it's typically just a range of ports and always, you know, sort of a four or five different names for the XML, basically. You can just probe for it, basically, without using UDP. So even if some sort of firewall or provider so is blocking UDP 1900, that does not mean that it's, you know, there might still be um, the TCP port for the UPnP interface for the SOAP interface, open on port 5000, for example, and willing to accept commands. Um, yeah. Also, H.D. Moore, he had a look. So most vendors are not implementing their own UPnP stacks, which is probably a good idea. They're buying or using open source or using just a few different stacks, really. So he found there was four different software development kits used in yeah, three quarters of these devices. That also means, of course, when you find a vulnerability in one of these uh, libraries, um, that's good enough to attack millions of devices. It's sort of critical that way. Oh yes, then of course client-side vulnerabilities. So, so far what we had is the typical approach is operating system sending out a multicast packet on the local network, are there any UPnP devices? And the device replying with, yes, sure, I'm over here, and my um, TCP interface is on this HTTP port. But according to the standard, um, the client, the you know your printer for example, 
may do so on a periodic basis and do just the same, you know, without being requested. Just send out the multicast packet. Well, actually, I'm a UPnP device. I'm over here. If you want to talk to me, my HTTP is up there and, you know, just find out what I can do for you. So that's what I was doing and sending these packets to the internet, just announcing myself as a UPnP device. Hi, I'm a UPnP device. I have an HTTP port. If you want to talk to me, you know, just connect. So once again, if you think about this, it means I'm sending on an easily spoofable UDP packet announcing an HTTP service, and you wouldn't believe how many requests I got back, downloading my XML file. Um, so that means I can get millions of devices to connect to an HTTP server of my choice. It doesn't have to be mine. It's not connecting back to the source IP address. It's connecting back to whatever I spe specify in the UDP packet. So I can get it to you know, execute malicious requests on remote sites for you know, exploitation or for DOS. Mm -hmm. I was wondering about the click fraud, really. Um, if I set up a website and you know, include some sort of banner advertisement, and then uh, get a bunch of IoT devices to connect, you know, to click it. Um, well, it may or may not work. It didn't try it. Um, in general, of course, you get um, clients, you get software to download an XML file that you created, that you specified. And we all know XML is sort of hard to pass, especially if you really get into it. Um, so there might be malicious XML files that you can craft to potentially execute code. Um, that's just a bunch of user agents that I saw connecting back to me. It was interesting behavior. You saw firewall toast, obviously, because I was trying to connect back and find out what I, well, what was talking to me. And it wouldn't accept any connections, but it would happily reply to my UDP packet and connect back to me and download the XML. Um, yeah, I saw network attached storage. I saw some business gateways. Um, and many, many more, you know, all sorts of bigger and smaller IoT devices, basically. Um, attacking client applications now. That's research from a colleague of mine. It's uh, Alexander Nikolic. And um, when I was doing my stuff, he was, well, auditing a UPnP client-side library because, you know, you have applications like, it doesn't have to be games, there's also, um, Basically, whatever needs to exchange data over network and receive a remote connection from the internet will want to talk to your router especially to do what we saw earlier and request a port forward so connection can come back in. So that's what he was having a look at. And yeah, he, saw, he found uh, torrent clients, cryptocurrency using UPnP and running you know, a bunch of libraries and he audited, um, which one is it? The was mini UPnP, I guess this one, yeah. That's the one he audited. Um, it's in widespread use for many different clients. And he actually found a bug in there in the XML parsing. So this code that he audited and where he found a bug is, or was being used at least, in on the top left, that's transmission, it's a torrent client. Um, top right, Bitcoin, we all know what that is. And Tor, used to use it. That was quite interesting because a bit earlier they removed it from the code base and they wrote something like, um, the C code here was fine, but frankly, we don't trust the underlying libraries. And yeah, they were right about it, actually. So what he found was an overflow in the XML parser, which means um, your, I mean, your typical setup is he wrote an exploit to act as a UPnP server on the local network. And it was just, uh, uh, sorry, just um, waiting for your typical UPnP packet to arrive, you know, something like, are there any devices I would like to talk to one? So, and he would reply, yeah, sure, I'm over here. There's my XML file, come and get it. And that's what happened. So the application fetches the XML, starts parsing it. Um, there was a mem copy and a buffer overflow, and he managed to um, execute code on the application. Now the fun application that he decided to exploit back then was Bitcoin. So that means he was able to take over Bitcoin clients over the local network. The moment the Bitcoin main client started up, it would do, you know, send out a UPnP request. Is there any UPnP device on the network? 
Um, the exploit would reply, yeah, sure, my XML file is over there. Um, trigger the exploit, um, take over the client. It's, you know, sort of a, could be an expensive bug. <laughs> Fix banner, of course. Demo, um, we'll skip this for now, actually, maybe in the end. Um, we had some technical problems while setting everything up, so maybe not. Um, yes, auditing UPnP. So if you're on your home network or also in the company, it's quite interesting really to just fire up Wireshark and look for UDP packets on port 1900 because there are quite a bunch of them flying around always from, from your colleagues, from operating systems, you know, just like Windows, Linux, whatever. But also you realize that you have devices on the network like, what is that? Oh, wait, that's an, um, uh, that's an Apple, what's the thing you call the media center? <laughs> Sorry? No, the Apple Media Center, the small box. Apple TV, Apple TV yes, thanks. Apple TV, for example, on, and you know, and similar. That's just stuff that's on, on regular networks and asking for UPnP. So if you want to find out what kind of functionality your UPnP device is offering, um, there's a little tool called Miranda, um, written in Python. Um, Miranda is very helpful because it will connect and you can just bit like in a browser, I mean it's text interface, but still you can just connect to your device and map all the different functions, see what kind of interface, inter, sorry, what kind of functions the interfaces provide. You can call the functions, you can provide parameters, you can change settings and so on. And that's quite helpful. Defense. Um, I mean, yeah, patching obviously, or just removing it if possible would probably be even better. Um, IDS, IPS rules will help mostly. Um, not my preferred solution really. Like I said, if you can just disable it, remove it. It's just not a good idea to run really. Um, what else? Yeah, general sanity. No one needs to run UPnP on an external interface to be reachable over the internet. If you're doing that, you're just doing it wrong really. Um, same goes for port forwarding, of course. Uh, port forwarding requests from the outside to the inside, that's not functionality. It should even be possible for whatever reason. Millions of devices will happily do it. Um, yeah, and yeah, like I said, patches, but we all know how that works. Um, conclusion, yeah, UPnP is amazing. It's the best protocol ever if you're an attacker. <laughs> if not, if you're a defender, like I guess most of the room, um, do something about it. Disable, if possible. Um, thanks a lot for now. If you have any questions, go ahead. And yeah, we might try the demo later. Okay. Okay, first of all, thank you for a very interesting talk. I'm gonna have to try some of that stuff. You um, so are there any questions? So uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, you could have uh, tell us all this about five years, six years ago. Yeah. And uh, it's right the same. It kept the same. And I wonder, uh, there is only a bunch of, I don't know, five or, or six yeah. uh, uh, really deployed UPMP stacks. And I don't know, uh, mm -hmm. back then, six years ago, uh, there were only two with known authors and uh, the rest was unknown. Hmm. Did anything change? Uh, uh, from what I saw, the, the, the HD Moore uh, graphic uh, said it doesn't change. Uh, so there are still several, yeah. uh, several UPMP stacks that, are, that have no hmm. known author. You know how it is. It's the whole um, never change a running system and it always is about money in the end, and it's cheap to use software, it just sort of works. Um, I don't think it, it really changed. I'm really waiting mostly for the protocol to be phased out and replaced by something else. It's a mess. Is there any software to, uh, to check which UPMP stack is implemented? Sorry, is there any what? Is there any, any, any software uh, that can remotely check the, the UPMP stack that is implemented? 
like I said, I mostly I use Miranda for auditing, and I don't know any other software really. Okay. But um, yeah, I'd go with Miranda for the moment, really. Thanks. But you have all sorts of even in the same stacks, vendors uh, you know modify the code base, so you have different replies from the same software or different versions maybe also. But yeah, it's hard to I don't know. It's difficult really. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, I'm wondering, I'm seeing in a lot of hotels and everywhere, a lot of bonjour services also. Yeah. Uh, have you taken a look at them? I haven't. Um, as far as I know, bonjour is more, like I said, that's the, it's more static. It doesn't allow you, like UPnP does, to implement your own services or whatnot on top. As far as I know, bonjour is more like you have to stick to the standard and nothing but the standard. So it's probably also why UPnP is so, um, so widespread because that's the functionality you know, that it offers. It's, um, it's, you know how it is, it's a feature. Um, have you been looking into the feature of you know, UPnP support somehow of media streaming and they have a limited audio yeah. and video support and I guess they at least at, I have a home cinema thing mm. that kind of can stream from my mobile and yeah, it yeah. somehow needs to transform this data, and I guess this data can also be exposed mm. because you have audio and video decoders on the on the client side. I didn't have a close look at audio video, and I remember it's my what was it DVD player, whatever, or something in my home network as well. It also offered UPnP services. I did have a look. Uh, it's what you describe. That's yeah, audio video um, streams. Like I said, I didn't have a close look at it. Um, something else, by the way, that UPnP provides is eventing. So it reminds me of SNMP, so you can um, subscribe to events and have events, um, you know, when they happen, send out packets to probably also sources that you specify somewhere. So, um, well, um, it's basically something that should be looked at, I guess, really. UPnP eventing could be something else where you just, you know, supply a single packet to um, subscribe to an event, um, provide a source IP address, and it's, it's not yours. And if there's plenty of events, there might be plenty of packets. OK. Another question? <laughs> Sorry again. Um, yeah. We had a discussion in our office because we have a Sonos, like this audio mm -hmm. thing. And I guess it's also somehow U UPnP connected. How do you isolate such devices? Because um, um, you need to connect with your phone at least to to, to the device, and <laughs> it's very complicated. We had yeah. internal discussion about this: how um, put it on a different network, but then you have always to switch, and yeah, it's mm -hmm. not an e easy task. Uh, isn't that the the general problem about security versus? Um, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Maybe have a close look, uh, you know, run Miranda on it, really. It would be interested to, to see the results. And maybe it's just, you know, offering, you know, innocuous functions, nothing special about it. But um, maybe it will, you know, spit out the admin password in plain text. That's the same password, like, on the rest of your network. I don't know. Um, yeah. But really, run Miranda on it and see what happens. And, yeah, just see what happens. Good, good luck. <laughs> more questions. No more questions. No more. So we still have eight minutes if you want to do, yeah. We could try the demo. Good um, luck. I just, I'm not very confident that it will work. So what I have here is the, the exploit my, my colleague wrote. And I wonder if... I can move this over here. Oh, that's not too bad. Now I can't read it from here. So that's the yeah, that's the exploit. It's already running, um, waiting for connections to come in. And that's the other shell. That's the one probably, that's the one I want. So that's Bitcoin, that's the, um, the QT interface. 
And when I hit enter, it's going to you know, start up. You'll see the interface. And I can just tell you it's sending out the UPnP packet. And the exploit will reply with the, yeah, sure, I'm over here. Grab the XML, pass it, have fun, good luck. And the, I'm sorry, the connect back shell is probably not going to work. What you will see is, well, let's try it. Bitcoin starting up, the interface. And yeah, so here's your sec fault. And what do you see on the, on the exploit side? Yeah, exactly. That's the shell, which sadly did not work, but the exploit is over here. Um, so he, like I said, that's what he did. He set it up on the network to listen for the UPnP packets, reply, send the exploit, and it, well, you saw the client crash. Trust me, it worked for him. And yeah, Bitcoin was quite an interesting target at least. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, if nobody else has any questions, then I have one more question. Go ahead. Yeah, you said uh, Miranda can be used for auditing. Yeah. Um, could it also be used to continuously monitor in your own network if A, there are any UPnP devices or if anyone uh, answers to any uh, UPnP It's devices? probably the wrong piece of software, really. Okay. I mean, it will, um, you can list the devices it saw on the network. So it will tell you, yes, you know, the list of networks that it, uh, sorry, devices which um, send out packets so far. But you probably want something else. Maybe. You know, it's write a piece of code, a couple lines of code just basically. You're yeah, listening you, you in UDP 1900. That does that Sorry? Already. You can't recommend anything that does that already. No, I can't. Okay. Because I can, I mean, I, I, I could understand yeah. how people are now a little bit worried about yeah. the stuff that's in their networks and they might really? want might, might to think about that, <laughs> maybe. But um, yeah, so you better start yeah. coding. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank, yeah. Uh, thanks uh, again for the great talk. Pleasure. And yeah. Thanks.